So on behalf of the Harry Bridges Center for Labor Studies and the Labor Solidarity Project here at University of Washington Tacoma, I'd like to welcome everyone to the first installment of our fall seminar series, Working Together. And this actually marks the beginning of our third academic year of public programming. Uh, so I just want to take a second to thank everyone for their continued support, especially the uh, familiar names I'm seeing on the list of attendees. Uh, this year, this quarter, we're going to continue to showcase the work of established and emerging scholars in the field of labor studies. And we're going to continue to amplify the work of activists out there on the front lines fighting for the common good. And this evening, we're actually we're joined by somebody who checks both of these boxes, scholar and activist. Dr. Charles Chuck Keeney is an assistant professor of history at Southern West Virginia Community and Technical College. And he joins us tonight to share his recent book, uh, The Road to Blair Mountain, Saving a Mine Wars Battlefield from King Cole, which was actually published uh, just earlier this year, which just so happens to be the centennial of the Battle of Blair Mountain. And it was published by West Virginia University Press. Um, and this this book is, I've, I've told Chuck before everybody else joined us, I think it's absolutely an amazing book uh, that explores the long history of this, you know, what really is a defining moment in American uh, history and American labor history. Uh, the book itself, it begins in 1921, but the actual focus uh, is on the decade long fight that that Chuck and that the friends of Blair Mountain waged to save the battlefield uh, from mountaintop removal and preserve its legacy. And I think, you know, it, it, it'll come as no surprise that this was by no means a fair fight. Uh, you know, it pitted ordinary citizens against the combined forces of the, the West Virginia political machine, uh, multi-billion dollar corporations, and the, you know, lo and behold, the military industrial complex. Uh, telling this story, uh, the road to Blair Mountain is, it's, it's both a history, but I also think it's a, an amazing field guide for activists who are looking to uh, to get involved organizing. It's beautifully written. Uh, it's an expiring book that really spotlights the ongoing battle for historical authority. Uh, Chuck begins the book, and this is one of my favorite quotes from the book is, uh, uh, quote, in West Virginia, everything is political except politics, and that's personal. And I think that this, uh, this intro would be incomplete if I failed to mention the fact that you know, for Chuck, uh, this was a fight where separating the political from the personal was was more or less impossible, uh, because in addition to being a scholar of this history uh, and an activist fighting to preserve this historical landmark, uh, Chuck's actually the great grandson of Frank Keeney, who was a union leader who helped organize the miners during the Battle of Blair Mountain 100 years ago. So talk about uh, is that triple threat? Um, <laughs> At the, at the very least, it is one heck of a legacy, and I am just so glad. I learned tonight that this is uh, Chuck's final presentation on Blair Mountain for this centennial year. He has been uh, all over the place interviewing, podcasting, uh, and, he, and he chose us as his final uh, presentation of the year. So thank you so much for joining us. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Chuck Keeney for, and, and and as always, what we're going to do is we'll set aside some time for Q&A after the presentation. Uh, but if you're uh, uh, taking notes at home, feel free to add your questions to the discussion board. So with that being said, uh, take it away, Chuck. All right, guys. Thank you. Uh, Alex, thanks so much for having me. I am glad to be uh, joining you guys tonight. And it's really a pleasure that People on the Northwest uh, are interested in this history. It's a history not a lot of people know about, even where I teach, uh, which is less than 10 miles from the actual battlefield. Uh, a lot of my students have never heard uh, about the mine wars, but we're going to get into all of that. So uh, I've got a kind of a complex story to tell you here, and it's multi-layered. And I'm going to begin, uh, there, there, there's, there's so much of it that I'm not going to be able to get into, so many different angles and layers within this book, because we're talking about uh, politics, we're talking about environment, we're talking about labor history, we're talking about current labor movements, we're talking about uh, forming coalitions between groups like the Sierra Club and the United Mine Workers of America, groups that were, were butting heads, that are supposedly you know, on the political left, 
but they were nonetheless butting heads in Appalachia and uh, in the coal fields. And we have to find ways to bring those types of groups together. Uh, on that note, I always use this as an example, but uh, whenever uh, Trump uh, greenlit the Dakota Access Pipeline uh, in 2017, and, you know, environmentalists on the left really decried the, the decision and, and talked about, you know, uh, all the damage that it would do. But uh, the president of the AFL-CIO, Richard Trumka, praised the decision. So you have the leader of the most powerful union organization in America praising the decision uh, that, that was done by Trump, while uh, other groups on the left, like the environmental groups, were, were saying it was an awful thing. And one of the barriers to progress we find in areas where fossil fuel extraction is uh, preeminent is we have to find ways to get industrial unions and environmental groups on the same page. We were able to do that at Blair Mountain. And so let me begin though, before I, I get into how, what I did is I kind of used my knowledge of history and my knowledge of the region as a tool for my activism and as a means of defeating the coal industry on its own turf. Because we were in the belly of the beast uh, in, in the heart of Logan County, West Virginia. It's not where I live. I live in Charleston, state's capital. But, about an, uh, but you drive about a half hour south of where I live and you get into coal country, which you know I grew up around coal country. And it's their turf. This is where they are the strongest. This is where they have a hold over people politically, economically, and culturally. And so we're going to talk about how to navigate uh, the power structure uh, in places, rural places, where fossil fuel industries hold a significant amount of power. And I'm also going to be talking about navigating the social structure and using history as a tool for successful activism. First, let me give you a little backdrop on the history. Quick mind wars in 15 minutes or less. <laughs> we'll see how, how well this goes. So the West Virginia mind wars. This is what establishes the power structure in central Appalachia. At the dawn of, uh, you know, the industrial transition that was taking place in the United States when uh, it really kicks underway in the late 1800s, you get into the Gilded Age, they begin to find the enormous amounts of coal deposits that exist in West Virginia. And it's high quality coal, it's both metallurgic coal for use in steel, and it's also thermal coal, which is uh, used for electricity. Two main types of coal production, thermal coal for electricity, metallurgic coal for steel. And both of those things are needed in very uh, big amounts once we get into the industrial age. Uh, my great grandfather, Frank Keeney, was born in 1882 the same year that the, that the world's first coal-fired power plant debuted in New York City. So he was born right on the cusp of this era. What happens here? Well, coal companies, steel companies, and railroad companies come into central Appalachia, and they be begin get getting up the land in a variety of underhanded and semi-legal and illegal ways. Give, give you some examples. Uh, West Virginia broke away from Virginia in the Civil War, joined the North uh, in, in the Civil War. Some of you, of course, already know that. But after they did that, uh, a whole bunch of new land deeds were written out for pioneer families. What the coal industry did is they went back to Virginia and bought old Virginia land deeds. And then they went to uh, small mountain families and said that their deeds the, were the original deeds and therefore had legal precedence over uh, the deeds that were in new in West Virginia. And so they took locals to court and through a process of buying out and bribing judges, uh, they were able to get either court cases in their favor or they were able to simply outspend local families, and they were able to take a lot of land that way. My own family, for example, lost around 3,000 acres of uh, their land to the coal industry uh, along Cabin Creek, which is where the mine wars get started. And if, if they couldn't take the land that way, they used other things. There was the creation of the broad form deed, which enabled uh, companies to buy the mineral rights of properties to get, if you can't get the soil, you can buy everything underneath the soil and get rights to what is underneath the soil and ruin people's land that way, a lot of other ways. 
in, in, in which they were able to take control of the land. So they take control of the land and they begin the establishment of this company town system. And many of you again are familiar with company towns, but one thing that was unique about company towns in West Virginia, interesting by the way, Amazon is talking about doing company towns now as well. So uh, it, it reiterates a point that I keep making in the book is that uh, uh, Blair Mountain isn't who we were, it's who we are. So that type of struggle never ends. Nonetheless, the company town system in West Virginia was a little bit unique in that you had a much higher concentration of workers that were in company towns than in any other state, particularly in coal mining towns. Uh, you had about, it varies estimates, but between 80 and to 90% of all the coal miners working in West Virginia were living in company towns. The state with the second highest number was Illinois and that was 48%. So much higher ratio of the workforce living in company towns, which gives the companies considerably more control. And in these company towns, they have the, you know, the company store, the company church, the company school, uh, the company saloon, uh, and of course the company money. There's a wonderful piece of script that we have uh, uh, at the Mind Wars Museum, a uh, uh, institution I'll talk about in a bit that I helped found, is we have some pieces of script and each company had their own type of script that they issued for their miners and they issued their own so that you couldn't use it interchangeably in somebody else's company store so everybody had their own script that they issued from company to company and in logan we we found a, a piece of script that just says good for one loaf of bread and that's what you were handed uh, on, on your payday so that they were determining not just that you couldn't buy in American dollars and you had to buy in the company store, but in some cases they were determining what you could buy. In addition to all of those elements of control, they, uh, they also had the mine guard system, this brutal uh, police state that was enforced throughout uh, the coal fields. And they usually hired people out from the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency but in some cases, they just uh, bribed sheriffs and gave them the funds to hire deputies. In Logan County, where I teach now, you had a sheriff by the name of Don Chafin that was paid about $120,000 a year in the early 1900s by the Logan County Co-Operators Association to enforce company policy. And he had 300 deputies in Logan County. By the way, there are currently four in Logan County today. Um, <laughs> for the whole county. There were 300. If you know Logan County, it's not in need of a lot of policemen. But nonetheless, there, uh, there were 300 of them back then. They were enforcing company law. What did they do? They um, opened people's mail. They filled out your ballot box uh, on election day. They um, crawled under houses in Mingo County and left reports on what people talked about. We know this because we have the letters that agents from the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency, you know, wrote back to headquarters. Uh, those papers are at the Eastern Regional Coal Archives. And we found those letters and gone through the like operative number nine, operative number 16. They posed as bartenders. They posed as coal miners. They spied on people. They also cracked heads uh, and uh, murdered, sometimes murdered union organizers. They were the ones to evict families from their homes if they were fired. If uh, you know a coal miner died, which was frequent, West Virginia coal miners between 1880 and 1920 suffered a higher death ratio than the American Expeditionary Force in World War I. So it was uh, safer to go fight the Germans in France in 1918 than it was to work in a West Virginia coal mine. But when somebody died, they evicted the family from the home if the husband died in a coal mining accident. And it would be the Baldwin Feltz detectives or the mine guards that would enforce that. This uh, brutal system and the violence which, which they imposed upon the miners led to violent revolts that uh, we call the West Virginia Mine Wars. It started up in 1912 along Paint Creek and Cabin Creek, where my family lived. And, uh, and, and this was it was a very interesting type of movement. On one hand, it's very class oriented in that you have uh, native mountaineers, you have immigrants, large uh, amounts of immigrants were brought into the coal fields. There were some coal camps where uh, well over 20 languages were spoken. 
in some of these camps. So you had lots of big groups of immigrants, about a third of the whole workforce was immigrants and about 20% of the workforce was African-American, which was much higher you know, than the population ratios of that time. And the United Mine Workers, of course, was one of the first labor unions to actively try and organize African-Americans. You had African-American organizers, guys like Dan Chain in the Pink Creek Cabin Creek strike, who was also known as Few Clothes Johnson. Uh, he was also a character uh, in the movie Mate One, if any of you have seen the labor uh, movie classic Mate One. You can watch it on YouTube, by the way, for free if you want to. But uh, James Earl Jones played Few Clothes Johnson, who was uh, an African-American organizer. And in fact, the first miner to be killed in the Battle of Blair Mountain was an African-American. Um, whenever miners were marching to Blair Mountain, they desegregated places as they went. Uh, they went into one coal camp uh, just six miles north of Blair Mountain, and uh, they went into the company cafeteria where they had different sections for whites, one for blacks and one for immigrants, and they forced the company cooks to cook everybody a meal and serve everybody in the same room. And this is 1921 when this is happening, you know, a good generation before even the U.S. military desegregated. So you did have a union movement and a labor movement that was cutting across uh, racial and ethnic lines here. But it was also a family thing. It wasn't just minors on revolt. It was their whole families. But like my family, the Keeney family, whenever they were evicted from their homes, uh, it was my great grandfather, his wife, uh, their two kids, and she was pregnant. But it was also their, their uh, his, Frank Keeney's mother-in-law and father-in-law were also evicted from their homes. He had several cousins that were evicted. Uh, immediate families and extended families were evicted. And these were families that held land in the previous generation. And they took to violent revolt. They started up guerrilla warfare throughout the Pink Creek, Cabin Creek strike in 1912 and 1913. My great grandfather kind of took over the strike whenever union uh, representatives were too afraid to go into Cabin Creek to organize, and he took it over. And you had other, of course, major labor figures like Mother Jones that came to the region. Eugene Debs uh, also came uh, to the area. And uh, the song Solidarity Forever was written right after the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek strike after the author of, oh shoot, who, who wrote Solidarity Forever? Um, I'm, my brain is slipping. Um, now, uh, but anyway, he, he literally been, buried in Tacoma. <laughs> I'm, huh? I'm forgetting the name. What, uh, Ralph, Ralph Chaplin. Chaplin, thank you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, so Ralph Chaplin visited the, the tent colonies along Paint Creek and Cabin Creek, and then uh, after that wrote Solidarity Forever. But uh, miners and their families lived in tents, uh, probably somewhere around 15,000 total uh, for over a year. You had some very serious shootouts which took place, uh, the bull, most famous of which is maybe the Bull Moose Special in which uh, the coal companies uh, manned their uh, trains with uh, machine guns and they would fire machine guns into the tent colonies. And uh, so pitched battles, but the miners won and they won the right to unionize. They won the right to be paid in American money. And uh, they won a few other uh, concessions from the coal operators. By the way, when they went on that strike, they didn't ask for more money. They didn't ask for a raise. They wanted to be paid in American money. They wanted the abolition of the mine guards. Uh, they uh, wanted the right to unionize. Uh, and uh, they wanted the abolition of child labor because a lot of kids were working in the mines at that time as well. So they win this strike. My great grandfather then becomes president of the United Mine Workers in West Virginia after the strike, and he becomes president of the West Virginia State Federation of Labor also. Uh, and uh, then during World War I, they do this massively successful union organizing drive in which they organize all of the counties except three, Logan, Mingo, and McDowell counties. And this is where the big battles of the mine wars took place between 1919 and 1921. The famous gunfight at Mate One that killed 10 people, the three days battle of the Tug, uh, which killed over 30 people, uh, some really bloody warfare the, that was taking place. But uh, it escalated in the summer of 1921 to where miners, uh, after an, another declaration of martial law, miners began assembling in Marmette. 
in late August and began, they formed an army. Of course, they wore the red bandanas around their necks and were called the Red Neck Army as a result of that. And they uh, marched south to try to get to Mingo County to uh, relieve uh, starving families, bring them food. And also they wanted to uh, release miners that were being held in prisons there because they had rounded up all the miners in the tent colonies and put them in pens. And then they wanted uh, to avenge the recent assassination of Sid Hatfield and Ed Chambers, two lawmen that had stood up for the coal miners. Both of them were gunned down in front of over 50 witnesses on August the 1st, 1921. So anyway, they're trying to march to Mingo County, but they don't get to Mingo County because they have to go through Logan County to get to Mingo County. And there, Sheriff Don Chafin, the guy I mentioned earlier, had established an army of around 2,000 uh, state troopers uh, you had volunteers, mine guards, Baldwin Feltz detectives that had set up defensive positions along a 12 mile front uh, from Blair Mountain all the way to Mill Creek. And the miners' army and uh, King Cole's army clashed from August the 31st to September the 4th, a five day battle before federal troops were brought in and then miners surrendered. So that's a very, very brief synopsis. Uh, there was a significant aftermath to the Battle of Blair Mountain, how it would shape labor relations and politics. One of the things that, that, that is important though is that the miners didn't win the Battle of Blair Mountain. Now, ultimately they would be able to unionize once the New Deal came along, but the union was nearly destroyed in West Virginia for the decade after the Battle of Blair Mountain. There was a series of treason trials uh, my great grandfather was uh, charged with treason uh, after the battle, uh, he, you know, for starting the whole thing. Uh, the, the trials were held in the courthouse in Jefferson County in Charlestown, West Virginia, which is the same courthouse where John Brown was tried for treason uh, in his, um, after John Brown's raid in 1859 that, you know, really brought us toward the Civil War. So, same place where they uh, held two separate treason trials in West Virginia. So the treason trials went on uh, this, the decade after that also saw the largest uh, uh, rise in minor accidents and deaths in West Virginia history. Over 400 miners a year died in the 1920s in coal mines. So they had over 4,000 deaths in mines just in that decade alone. But the, this power structure was established. Yes, miners get the right to unionize, and as this power structure is firmly established and the, the coal companies subvert politicians and it didn't matter what party they, they, were, they were a part of, Democrat or Republican, both parties were equally controlled by the industry. And you should know that today if you follow politics in America. We currently have a Democratic senator by the name of Joe Manchin. And if you don't know who writes his checks, I'll give you a big, big guess. Uh, on, on, on who does that. Uh, he is, you know, uh, the coal industry are our strong patrons of uh, Senator Manchin, even though he's a Democrat, because that's the way it works in West Virginia. So they had this huge amount of control. And they used this control not only to, uh, you know, gain control over the workforce and the economy and the politics of the region, but also the mindsets of people that live in coal country. I call it the mind guard system in the book, a transition from uh, when the mind guards reigned in the company towns. They couldn't do that after the Great Depression, after the mind guard system is abolished. So they go to try to control information. They worked to make sure that history of Blair Mountain, the history of the mine wars were kept out of textbooks. They founded an organization called the American Constitutional Association. And I have a whole chapter about this and I follow the paper trail, which shows how governors even intervened uh, in what was going on in the classrooms and secondary schools to make sure that nothing anti-coal or nothing that would be critical of the coal industry would find its way into a textbook. And uh, I even quote from the actual textbooks. It was well over 50 years after the Battle of Blair Mountain that, that it was mentioned in state history textbooks. And that was in 1972. And there was one paragraph 
uh, dedicated. It, it basically says that it happened. There was something happening at Blair Mountain, but it doesn't go into detail. But anyway, this was an active part on the industry to control the narrative. As the 21st century gets going, the industry doubles down on its propaganda. And I want to talk about this for a minute. They created an organization called the Friends of Coal in West Virginia. And if you're in West Virginia, it's everywhere. Friends of Coal. There's Friends of Coal bumper stickers. Businesses have the Friends of Coal stickers on their doors. Uh, you hear uh, radio commercials all the time. If you turn on a radio in West Virginia within five minutes, you hear a coal commercial. Uh, the, uh, they sing a song called Coal is West Virginia. Uh, they have coal in the classroom. They have the festivals, coal festivals in each town where they have high school students do coal projects. They uh, really have a very strong impact over events. They also have a form of 21st century welfare capitalism where the industry builds little league baseball fields and high school football fields with big Friends of Coal logo on, on the fields. And they sponsor sporting events with West Virginia University, Marshall University. So they're all over the place and they have this very strong control uh, over what happens in the classroom, over the local media. And it's in this atmosphere that I uh, was working on my dissertation I was pretty apolitical at the time. I wasn't really an activist uh, at the time. And I decided to take a job at a little community college in Logan in the coal fields as I was working on my dissertation, largely because I saw how the job market was going for professors. And I thought I'd better take something while I could. And so I go down to the coal fields. This was right when the Blair Mountain Battlefield uh, was delisted from the National Register of Historic Places. So the Blair Mountain Battlefield itself, the industry not just uh, only wanted to erase the history, they wanted to destroy the places connected to the history. In the 1990s, for example, they bulldozed a, the home that Mother Jones was placed under house arrest in uh, during the Paint Creek, Cabin Creek strike that was on the National Register of Historic Places and the industry just bulldozed the house uh, in the 90s. Uh, and they intended to destroy the Blair Mountain Battlefield with mountaintop removal coal mining. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with mountaintop removal coal mining, but it is the most destructive form of coal mining that there is. Uh, it's where they blast the very tops of the mountains off in order to get to the coal. And mountaintop removal sites are gigantic. You have to see it from the air to really understand the massive scale. Over 2,000 miles of streams have been destroyed in central Appalachia in the last 30 years from mountaintop removal coal mining. Some of these sites are over 4,000, 5,000 acres large. Uh, they are big enough to put uh, I believe one count, one estimate I read that with the acreage that had been blasted, there was enough to put about seven Disneylands in central Appalachia uh, due to just what has been blasted and, and leveled off. So it's an enormous amount of area and it, it destroys the waterways. It really destroys the wildlife. It pollutes the air and the water and everything else. But nonetheless, the industry has a very powerful hold over the region's economics. And in the 80s and 90s, they were able to really destroy the UMWA and union resistance movement. And so when this happened, when it was delisted and the, the companies intended to blast the site, um, I got involved and I joined a group called Friends of Blair Mountain, and we decided to organize a protest march. This was 10 years ago. We organized a protest march where we would retrace the actual footsteps of the miners' march. And we, it was a week-long protest march that we did. But uh, in order to get the march off the ground, we were going to have to depend upon environmental groups because there had been uh, you know, environmental activism in the region against mountaintop removal. And we were able to get the uh, support of environmental groups uh, to be a part of this and, and help us organize this. However, we were not able to get the support of the United Mine Workers of America. 
because uh, the environmental groups insisted on making the march about ending all mountaintop removal. And there were, of course, union coal miners uh, were working on mountaintop removal sites. And so the UMWA was not going to come out and make a statement against uh, mountaintop removal, which left us in a bit of a bind because I wanted to win over locals. And it's very, very difficult to win over locals when we just had environmentalists. And I've said this many, many times before, but being called an environmentalist in coal country is kind of like being called a witch in colonial Salem uh, or, you know, a, a communist in the 1950s. It is <laughs> once that stigma is on you, people aren't going to listen to anything you say because uh, people's jobs uh, depend upon the industry and the economy has been very dependent upon the industry. And again, you've been, I've mentioned the propaganda, which I go into a very big detail on in my book. So what we've had to do then is we had to navigate this really weird type of PR situation. We had a bunch of environmentalists and we had this very successful protest, but we did the protest. We had 800 people that marched to the Southern summit of Blair Mountain on the last day of the march. And it was, you know, an enormous event. We got national coverage, but then everybody went home. And I began, this was in my journey as learning how to be an activist as I found that, okay, the protest was, got a lot of attention and it raised a lot of awareness and a lot of people felt really great about it, but it didn't accomplish what we wanted to accomplish. The, the, they were still slated to destroy the battlefield. The governor wasn't going to have a change of heart. The regulatory agencies weren't going to overturn those coal permits just based on a protest. So we had to find alternative ways in which we were going to win. And so what we had to do is we had to do a few things, one of which is this uh, PR thing I was talking about. After the march, my, the group that I was elected president of, Friends of Blair Mountain, we embarked on an effort to distinguish ourselves from environmental groups and focus just on the history. Because if I came up to a coal miner, and I know lots of coal miners, and I teach coal miners in my classes, I have coal miners, uh, children of coal miners, grandchildren of coal miners, coal miners' wives, you name it. I have some coal miners that come in to my morning classes after the night shift still covered in coal dust uh, with their, you know, their work clothes on. So they come into my classes. So I'm, I see it and I'm around it all the time. If you approach one of these individuals and say, save Blair Mountain because of the history, they'll be okay. But if you say stop mountaintop removal, they'll want to punch you in the face. So we have to navigate this and find a way around it. And one of the ways in which we were able to do that is focus just on the history. If you save Blair Mountain, if you show that preserving this place is more valuable than the to the community than if you blast the place, then it is a springboard from which other conversations could be had. And that's one of the things that we were successful in doing. So how do we do this? I call it identity reclamation. Part of it is, is we're dealing with an identity and a history in Appalachia that's not our own, in part because uh, it was kind of taken from us and controlled by the coal industry, uh, and in part because of the way in which people reacted to uh, the coal industry with the mine wars, the violent reaction that uh, locals had uh, to the coal industry, the way in which they fought back. They didn't control the narrative. They didn't win the battle. Because of that, not only was the history suppressed, but when it happened, the media and those uh, friendly, the media that was friendly to the industry portrayed uh, the miners as a backward, uh, uncivilized culture. And that stereotype with the region really stuck. And because people don't know the history, both on a national level and even on a local level, those stereotypes and that stigma is still with the region. So people don't know who they really are because they don't know the history. And so we begin to use the history to kind of uh, rediscover who we were as a people. We did that in a couple of different ways. Uh, we, we created a journal uh, that, that would deal with the history and the need to preserve the place. We created the Mine Wars Museum in 2015 
this was a grad. This is a grassroots museum that we started up ourselves. We designed it ourselves. We gathered the artifacts ourselves, painted the walls ourselves, and we did everything and put together this little museum in historic Matewan right in the center of the mine wars activity and uh, told the story of the mine wars that had never been told before right in the middle of coal country. And we've been enormously successful. And because we were able to just focus on the history, we've been able to win over the local population that, but when we started it, they just you know thought we were you know just a bunch of uh, hippies that uh, wanted to stop coal. But by the time we were able to get the museum up and running and share the history more with people in the region, they were able to look at the preservation in a very different light. And we've been able to really alter uh, the, 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 the way people view it. Matewan, by the way, is this fascinating little place. Um, the first uh, weekend that we had the museum opened, uh, the weekend after the grand opening, Don Blankenship came to the museum. And if you're familiar with the coal industry, Don Blankenship was kind of one of the chief coal operators uh, in America for a long time. He was a uh, head of Massey Energy when they had the upper big branch disaster a little over 11 years ago that killed 29 miners. And he was more than any other individual responsible for destroying the United Mine Workers uh, as an organization in Appalachia. But he has a little train depot that he had built at one end of the town where he tells his version of the story. And we have our little Mine Wars Museum that tells uh, the miners version of the story on our end of the town. And so it, it's this crazy little dynamic. There's also, by the way, a guy with the name of, uh, oh man, Bill Baldwin, a descendant of William Baldwin, uh, who's founded the Baldwin Feltz Detective Agency. And he stands outside of our museum and tries to deter people from going in there and tells everybody that we've got the wrong story, that uh, the coal companies had it right. And the, the, the mine guards were actually this, you know, loving paternal police force. So it's a fascinating dynamic that goes on in there. But we were able, through the museum, through uh, creating a history journal uh, on the mine wars, begin to win over the local population. But we also had to navigate uh, the, the, the politics uh, of the region. And we had to know the power structure and how power structures work on a local level. Uh, Alex brought up the quote at the beginning of the book in West Virginia, everything's political except politics and that's personal. And it is extraordinarily personal. It's easy to study how power structures work on a macro level. And I think our universities do a good job sometimes of explaining how they work on a macro level, but you have to understand it on a micro level if you are going to be successful in activism. You have to understand how the local politics work, how uh, the relationships in local politics work. Let me give you an example. It's easy uh, to think, well, okay, the coal industry controls everything. Uh, yes, I will give you some tactics. I just saw a question come up in the, in the chat. Yeah, I'll try to get to some of those in a moment. The, uh, what, but what we did with um, this power structure and the way things work, the idea is that the industry can control everything. For example, the West Virginia Department of Environmental Protection, the West Virginia DEP. Uh, they don't really enforce the environment very much in West Virginia. The head of West Virginia DEP is, uh, is appointed by the governor uh, of the state. And uh, what can happen to a regulator with the, the Department of Environmental Protection in West Virginia if they don't get with the program, if they don't overlook things? There are all kinds of different little social pressures that are put on it because a regulator goes to he uh, lives in the same community as the foremans of the coal camps and the supervisors and the miners. They all live in the same communities. Their children go to the same churches. They go to the same schools. So if a regulator doesn't uh, get with the program and starts writing up violations uh, to a coal company for, you know, things that they're doing wrong with streams, well, next thing you know, uh, their kid doesn't make the Little League baseball team or the daughter doesn't uh, make the cheerleading squad or little pressures like that because 
the the captain you know the, the head of the cheerleading coach is the wife of a mine superintendent this is the kind of stuff that happens because it is uh, the industry has controlled things for so long that to do what the industry wants has become a social norm and you have to understand that going in and so we had to do what i call become citizen regulators we have to give the regulators no other choice but to enforce the law and knowing West Virginia history and Appalachian history like I do, I know that the coal companies break the law all the time. It's simply a matter of finding how they broke the law and holding them accountable for it. So we knew that there had to be like some type of um, provisions in these permits or in historic preservation law that would give us a little edge here and there. We FOIA'd everything on earth. We had to learn all the different regulatory agencies like the State Historic Preservation Offices, the Department of Environmental Protection, OSMRE, the federal department that is the Office of Surface Mining Regulation and Enforcement, and the Army Corps of Engineers. And you had to learn all of these different regulatory agencies, what they do, how they issue permits, how they enforce those permits, get copies of all those permits, like a coal mining permit, surface mining permit, could be about 150 pages of information. And it can have everything from how much coal they think is there, uh, how, what kind of coal it is, how long it'll take to mine it, what methods they intend to use, uh, whether or not there may or may not be historic or places of historic heritage or historic significance, the floor they tend to blast, or if they're gonna cover any streams. It, it's really long and tedious and boring, but if you're going to be successful in activism in fighting the fossil fuel industry, you have to, attack them on this type of level. You have to find the details, find the places where they're cutting corners and not doing the things that are written down that they're supposed to be doing. And then you have to take those things and specific examples to the regulators to where they have no choice but to enforce the law. And we were in, in doing so, we were able to stop the construction of a National Guard special ops training base that they were going to put uh, beside the battlefield uh, that's a whole other aspect of the story. They not just only wanted to blast it for the coal, they wanted to create a military base there, but we stopped them from doing it by using these very methods. Uh, and I go into great detail in the book, but uh, we were able to slowly successfully navigate our way through there, stop the creation of a military base, begin to turn uh, public opinion in our favor. Public opinion is very much in our favor now, uh, nobody wants to see Blair Mountain destroyed now. Ten years ago, nobody knew it existed. And we were able to change that narrative in the heart of coal country. And we were able to put Blair Mountain Battlefield back on the National Register of Historic Places. when We won a federal lawsuit in 2016. And then in 2018, it was put back on the National Register. So it's protected now from surface mining. So we won that fight. And um, here we are today uh, with the book out. I wanted to try to cut off by 945. I could go into a lot more detail about this and I really skipped over a lot of things I wanted to talk about, but I see that there's a lot of questions. And so I did end the book with a, a list of advice for people that are getting involved in, in protests. And one of the things that I do say at the end that I hope that some of you younger folks yeah, I see a few youngsters there in, in, in the pictures uh, there. So for, for those of you that are younger that are thinking about getting involved, I recommend that you find your own Blair Mountain. And, and what I mean by that is you are most qualified to be an activist in some ways where you're from. You know your home and uh, you can find something near where you are that you can begin to change. And you need to use the advantages that you have where you're from and use that as an edge. And you need to try to work your activism from the grassroots up and find that own one thing uh, that, that, that you can work with and be successful with. But I want to get to some, to some questions here. I see that some are already up. And I'll start at the top. Okay. Okay, do you think that history is in a sense doomed to repeat itself in regards to workers being taken advantage of? Do you think things will be better or worse in the future? 
Okay, so uh, I wrote an article about this a couple of months ago. I wrote several centennial articles, and one of the and one, I wrote one article called "The Many Battles of Blair Mountain," and you see a lot of places around the world that are undergoing similar transformations that West Virginia underwent a century ago. And you see very bloody labor struggles that, that have been happening in Spain, in Asturias, in Northern Spain, they had their own coal mining war just 10 years ago uh, over there. Uh, you could look that up and find some details about that. In Peru, in Venezuela, you have labor organizers that are murdered. I believe in Colombia, I believe it is. I don't have the, the it right in front of me, but I believe, believe it was Colombia. 16 union organizers were killed in 2018 alone. You have the reemergence of company towns, not just what Amazon is, is, is proposing, but you have that in Southern Africa, in East Africa, in Indonesia, uh, where uh, places like Exxon and Chevron and uh, a, no a variety of different Chinese corporations have really strong company town systems that they've established in, uh, in the African continent. Uh, you have uh, also private police. The Pinkertons are still around. And in fact, uh, the Pinkertons, which were so prominent a century ago, Pinkertons were hired out, by the way, to do internet research and hack into computers of teachers that went on strike uh, in, in uh, 2018. And by the way, when the teachers went on strike, that, that was one of the things I was going to bring back up. When the teachers went on strike in West Virginia in 2018, uh, they started up, you know, a nationwide strike wave that began in West Virginia. The, by the way, the very first nationwide strike began in West Virginia, the 1877 railroad strike which began in Martinsburg. And that was the first documented case we have of workers wearing red bandanas around their necks that the coal miners would eventually do. And the teachers in 2018 in West Virginia, they all wore red bandanas around their necks. You can go back and look at the um, photos and they were taught, they were doing it to honor uh, the miners at Blair Mountain. And so that legacy had begun to reinsert itself in, in part because of our preservation. So. There's always going to be this ongoing battle. Uh, unions need to be more international in their scope. Uh, we need to think not just about organizing in the United States, but there has to be significant organizing in other countries. In order, in a globalized economy, you have to have globalized unions. And, and I think that learning from the past, learning the lessons of Blair Mountain is the best way to prevent another one. So, uh, are things going to be better or worse? It's hard to say, and it's hard to say how uh, environmental changes and climate changes, the uh, just living through the Anthropocene, are going to uh, alter the workforce and labor. So it's difficult to say. Okay, here's another one. How do we best navigate the need for green energy solutions? with the need for jobs and workers' rights in West Virginia and other areas with similar problems. Okay, uh, the first thing that has to change is land ownership. And absentee corporations still own most of the land in places like Appalachia. And in order for green energy jobs to come in, in a big way, the companies that own huge tracts of land have to be willing to do that. There have been proposals to put solar uh, solar plants on former mountaintop removal sites, which you could do, and you can employ a lot of people in central Appalachia that way. I mean, there's uh, close to a half a million people employed in solar energy nationwide. Maybe it's around 400,000 uh, today, uh, as opposed to 60,000 coal mining jobs right now in America. So you can employ way more people with solar, and solar is just doing about 17%, 16% of the energy in the United States, if that, if you increased solar energy to like 40% or 50%, you know, you could create um, hundreds of thousands of jobs. However, you have to change land ownership in order for, for that to happen. People are willing to go to those kinds of jobs if they're gonna be made available. The problem is, is that the industry is diminishing and going down really hard and there is no immediate job for people to step into. 
That's a, that, that's the main issue. And what politicians who want to go green, and I want to transition away from coal as much as the next person, but when people come in and they say, okay, we want you, we're going to have a green job for you, but first we want you to quit your job and we want you to go back to school. And while you have a couple of kids and are married, and we want you to retrain for 18 months or whatever for a green energy job that does not yet exist, but we promise it will 18 months from now. Uh, that's a hard sell uh, in areas like that. Uh, it just is. I mean, if, if you are 15, 20 years into a career and somebody tells you you need to stop your career, go back to school for 18 months, nobody's going to like that. Nobody's going to find that appealing. So uh, it, 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 it is difficult uh, to do that. But I mean, the market is destroying the coal industry anyway. And uh, it's when land ownership begins to change that, that you can begin to see a, a new economy really built here. Uh, can you give us a few examples of tactics that were used to destroy the United Mine Workers? Oh, yes, I can. So the United Mine Workers in America, they were an incredibly powerful union, incredibly powerful in the state. But uh, as we get into the 1980s, several things began to happen. Blankenship becomes uh, the higher executive at Massey Energy. It begins this very aggressive anti-union stance. By the way, Blankenship himself, when Blair Mountain was originally put on the National Register of Historic Places, Blankenship threatened to sue every staff member of the State Historic Preservation Office. So uh, he takes it very personally. But anyway, Blankenship would buy out a union mine and then close it down and then open the mine up again six months later as a non-union mine. This led to enormous strikes that began to take place. Blankenship was able to get the, the, the support of the state police, and they were able to win a couple of really long protracted strikes in the mid-1980s. They were also able to use surface mines to destroy the union because surface mines hire half as many miners as underground mines. Underground mines employ twice as many miners as, this, as a mountaintop removal site does. So with mountaintop removal sites, you're able to hire fewer miners with a smaller workforce. It gives you a greater degree of control and it also inevitably means fewer union members. So that was another way in which they were able to help uh, push the union out. And another thing that Don Blankenship did that was very crafty was he actually gave coal miners big raises, really increased the pay for coal miners in, in, in the 1990s. So that by the early 2000s, uh, outside of being a doctor or a lawyer, a coal miner was the best paying job in the, in the coal fields. You could go right out of high school and immediately earn 60 to $70,000 a year. In a place like West Virginia, where cost of living is considerably lower than it is in many other parts of the country, that's a, a good deal of money for an 18 year old to be making with just a high school diploma. And so because they, were, they raised the, the prices or raised the rates of pay, and, and they were able to do that, of course, but particularly with surface mine sites, because they didn't have to hire uh, nearly as many miners. They could still give miners a big raise, and it would still be cheaper for them to use a mountaintop removal site than it would be an underground site, and a lot cheaper if they don't have to worry about the union, because they don't have to worry about any safe health or safety regulations. And that's why uh, over 50 Massey miners died while Blankenship was CEO. So uh, they were able to use these variety uh, of ways. And uh, I should mention the, the part of the uh, animosity towards the environmental community is that as by the late 90s, when coal mining was actually becoming for the first time in its history, a good paying job, even though it was a really hazardous job and all the negative aspects of it, it was still a very good paying job, one of the best paying jobs you could get in central Appalachia. And as soon as that happened, then along comes the environmental movement. Uh, in the 90s and early 2000s that's trying to destroy the industry. And so just as people were finally making decent money working in coal mines, now you have a big, uh, a growing section of the population that's saying, we need to stop this altogether. 
And so it, it, it led to this kind of animosity against environmental organizations. And plus some of the tactics that environmental organizations would use, uh, they would do things like tree sits uh, or do things to halt production, like, you know, go up and camp out in a tree for a while or uh, like chain themselves to equipment. And that would halt production for a day or two. But what the companies would do is they would just dock the pay of the miners. So uh, they would offset any production costs by not paying the miners for any time that a, a protester shut down a site. So then the miners and their families, they're angry at the protesters because their paycheck gets cut into. And so that's why we moved away from those type of tactics at Friends of Blair Mountain because that was only going to turn people against us and it was not going to be a, a permanent solution. But anyway, that tells you a little bit about that. Okay, uh, Disney and Amazon seem to be really into the idea of company towns today. Uh, yes, uh, there was something called, uh, the question is, did any legislation arise from the West Virginia Coal Wars? Uh, there was legislation, um, well, there was legislation outlawing mine guards and private uh security forces by corporations in west virginia 1935 i believe is when the, the first law came into effect but uh they find their way around uh such laws they uh they passed a lot of interesting laws in west virginia history right after world war one they passed one that made it illegal to own a socialist flag in the state of west virginia uh uh, right after World War I. Uh, illegal. You can't have a socialist flag uh, in, in the state. I don't know if that law is still enforced or if anybody even knows that it exists, but yeah, the, the mine guards were outlawed in 35, but there's no law against company towns, uh, to, to my knowledge, and our current governor would probably be for it uh, because our current governor, Jim Justice, is a coal operator. So let's see. The reading has also stated that you have tried to do your own independent research to try to protect the lands from powerful industries that see it as only a way to gain profits. What were the biggest challenges that you have faced to protect them? And do, uh, and do these lands are there? Do they have been changed to be used for that purpose? Okay, so uh, if you wanna know about the status of the battlefield today, I encourage you to go to YouTube and look up the Google the Mine Wars Museum on, on YouTube. We have our channel there. Uh, we have a lot of programming that we've put up there, but I recently put up a, a little movie that we made, a little 15 minute video called Blair 101. And you can get an update on the current status of the battlefield. I go up on the battlefield on company property. <laughs> I do a little bit of trespassing uh, and show people uh, areas of the battlefield. And we also show areas that had been recently damaged because even though the battlefield is protected from surface mining, the National Historic Preservation Act does not protect the site from timbering or from natural gas drilling. And timbering is a big way in which the archaeology of the area can be taken away. And I haven't even gotten into the archaeology and why that's so important for the battlefield. Um, see, so what the biggest challenges that we faced, um, there were a lot of challenges that we faced, part of it being um, you had some folks, uh, I mentioned uh, we, we had internal issues where people disagreed on strategy. Uh, some of the more seasoned protesters or, or seasoned activists wanted to continue using tactics that they had been doing, i.e. tree sets and you know shutting down equipment and, and those types of things. And it was a challenging to get people on board with a different idea, a different approach, uh, that these tried and true tactics that have been used in a lot of different ways in a lot of different places uh, weren't going to work here uh, for a number of reasons that I've already explained. So that was a big challenge. Uh, but it was also, it was just the uh, pressure and intimidation that the, the, the we had to go through. And, and this is in the book in much more detail. Uh, on one of our citizen sites inspections, uh, one of our board members was threatened to be shot by an out of uniform state trooper. Uh, one of our other board members broke, uh, broke his ankle during that citizen site inspection and was hospitalized. Uh, me and other members of my organization have been threatened with violence. 
We've had her mail opened. Um, our lawyers had her mail open. Uh, several of our board members, I'd always put pictures on it on Twitter. If you go back, if you follow my Twitter chain all the way back to 2014 and 2013, I would put pictures up whenever they opened my mail. Uh, and uh, uh, they would, they hacked, I had my computer hacked six times. Um, you have, uh, there was also a lot of petty uh, things. I would get followed around by police. Uh, they like follow me to work. Uh, like state troopers would, uh, like they would just get right behind my car uh, on a four lane and stay there for like 20 miles. They wouldn't pull me over, but they would just follow me like right behind me. Uh, and they, they did this to other board members as well. So those kinds of things were, were the challenging part is over, overcoming that intimidation that they try to put on you, uh, ways to, to make you quit. It didn't work. It just made us angry, really. <laughs> uh, and, and losing wasn't an option for me uh, when I got involved in all of this. The, the, the very notion uh, that we were going to lose never entered my mind. Uh, my great grandfather uh, was successful on Pink Creek and Cabin Creek. So I thought, you know, if he can win, so can I. Um, and so I, I, I wasn't going to walk away from this on the losing side. And the fact that they were doing those things to us told me that we could win. It didn't make me think we couldn't win. It told me that we could win because that meant we were getting to them. That meant that they found us to be a threat, uh, that they couldn't laugh us off. Uh, and just say we're just a bunch of crazy, uh, you know, environmentalists out, out to kill coal. They had to really deal with us. And uh, uh, it, it kind of, in, in a weird, twisted kind of way, that kind of encouraged me to know that, that, okay, they're watching us this close, and they better watch us this close. And it doesn't matter if they watch us this close, we're going to beat you anyway. So uh, that was the, what the approach that we took. But anyway, you can look at that little 15 minute video if you want to see the status of the battlefield today and see what it looks like uh, and that kind of thing. Okay. Um, I hope I'm not too old to get involved. I'm 64. Thank you for speaking with us. Yeah, I hope you, that you do read the book. Uh, there are ways in which you can get involved. You know, we had, uh, I'll work with older activists all the time. Um, Joe Stanley. Mary Lynn Evans, Mary Lynn Evans, who made the, the brilliant film Blood on the Mountain, documentary film that, that, that talks about all these current issues in coal in the coal fields today. I believe it's on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on there or not, but it was. Uh, or uh, she's older. Um, Joe Stanley's a retired coal miner, retired union coal miners on our board. Uh, so we would they were able to do things, you know, issue FOIAs call up uh, regulators, call up the governor's office. Uh, we met, you know, with the coal executives themselves. And that was an important thing to do. We gained a lot of information that way, but it was important to meet the coal executives themselves, kind of stare them in the eyes and see who they were. And Joe Stanley, Mary Lynn Evans could play that role and could be the first person to approach them because they were a little bit older and they were taken a little bit more seriously. So sometimes your age can be an advantage to you. And it can lend you some credibility when reaching out to government agencies and um, politicians. Okay. Uh, what was the most stressful moment I endured? I don't know how to say this in a short story. Uh, the most stressful moment I endured, I mentioned a citizen site inspection. We had found... Uh, surface disturbances that, that they had done some clear cutting on the battlefield that were illegal that they weren't supposed to do and we had found that they weren't supposed to do this and we we were able to get a citizen site inspection arranged but before we were ever able to actually inspect the site that's when one of our board members was threatened to be shot by a state trooper who was out of uniform at the time uh, some fishy things going on there and uh, some other intimidation happened there that led to us the thing being called off. We went appealed to the West Virginia Surface Mine Board to um, uh, get on to to try to get to go back to the site to document these surface disturbances so that we could catch them in these illegal acts. About two weeks before our our, our trial before the Surface Mine Board, and we had a lawyer that represented us pro bono. She had never 
involved herself in any coal or environmental law or historic law before. She'd done environmental law, excuse me, but not coal or historic law. So we were all making this up as we went. We met in my place, actually here where I am now. Uh, the whole group did with our lawyer. We did a little mock trial. We put our strategy together. But two weeks before it happened, I got a, a, a letter one morning, the day before Thanksgiving. I got a letter saying that um, uh, our nonprofit Friends of Blair Mountain was found that uh, the uh, something was wrong with our taxes and uh, we were no longer valid as a nonprofit because we didn't fill out a tax form right like three years before or something. And uh, we were taken off as a nonprofit, which meant our uh, trial before the surface mine board would be moot because we were not an official organization recognized by the state. And so I had to, the day before Thanksgiving, luckily I was off that day, and, uh, and I had to go to the state tax office and then get that fixed. I found some nice old lady uh, that the, the, the helped me fix everything, and then go back to the Secretary of State's office and get us reinstated, then go to the West Virginia Surface Mine Board and get the uh, trial back up and going all before the end of the day because they had to have like 10 business days notice before uh, as interveners for us to be listed as a as a plaintiff or whatever on the case. And so if I didn't get us reinstated that day and get our tax problems fixed that day, our whole trial was gone and our whole effort was gone. And so I had to fix everything that day, the day before Thanksgiving and everybody the day before Thanksgiving in the state, everybody like leaves half a day early. So I had to go to the Secretary of State's office and there was one lady left there at the day, uh, and she was about ready to leave for the day. And she's like, we're closed. I'm not doing anything else. And I had to sit there and, and like turn on all my charm to try to talk her into staying an extra 15 minutes and getting us reinstated. That was the most stressful moment that day. Uh, but they were trying every little trick in the book to throw us off the path. And luckily we were able to navigate some things. Okay. How do you navigate the issue of working with both trying to convince union members and progressive environmental groups, which may not have a great record on unions, such as OVEC, the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, which has had some pretty public repression of their, of their staff union lately, to work together? Do you think that there was a bleed over? Do you think that the environmental groups will look more at labor and labor groups will look more at environmental needs? Okay, I do think that there is. I mean, uh, I, if you look at the uh, channel, uh, our YouTube channel for the Mind Wars Museum, I hosted a show called Mind Wars Forum in which I interview a variety of people. And I do an interview with Cecil Roberts, the president of the UMWA. Somebody like said, the UMWA did not uh, even recognize our march when we initially did it. But we began reaching out to the UMWA. I began reaching out to the UMWA and I began to establish a relationship with Cecil Roberts. And he's very open to talk about climate change. And he's very open to talk about a transition away from the coal industry. But uh, he also is adamant about things like pensions for coal miners being protected, their health care benefits being protected. As these coal companies go bankrupt, they throw off all of their pension liability, all of their environmental uh, liability, all of their uh, healthcare uh, liability for you know black lung benefits and things like that. And that has to be preserved. And so the UMWA right now is making that fight uh, for retired miners to make sure that they still have pensions and healthcare and all of these things as companies continue to go bankrupt. And they're willing to work with environmental groups. Like I said, they work, they use kind of Blair, uh, Friends of Blair Mountain was kind of the bridge group between the UMWA on one side and the Sierra Club and OVEC and some of these environmental groups on the, on, on the other side. Uh, they could kind of both get behind the banner of history. They could get behind the banner of heritage. I, I think using uh, historic places uh, and heritage as a place in which you can begin to say, we can preserve these places. We can uh, keep these places from being touched with fossil fuel industry. You can convince local populations to do that. And if you can do that, you can begin to get them to see an economy in a different way. 
and get them both groups to work uh, uh, in that way. So it is a little bit tough uh, in in the situation with uh, the way environmentalist groups and the, and coal miners interact with one another. It, it can be very tough at times, uh, largely because there isn't a present economic alternative. And in uh, what well, and in trying to start up heritage tourism with what we've done with the Mine Wars Museum, we've taken a little town like Matewan and kind of turned it around. Four new businesses have started up in this town since we moved there and it was desolate. There was nothing there in this tiny little town. And people are beginning to see that. Uh, I think that uh, environmental groups, they're not necessarily hostile to labor groups. They talk a good game, but at the same time, you have to be willing to reach out to miners and their families. And uh, it, it's very difficult to do. And they, that begins by changing the public narrative. You change the public narrative uh, or the narrative that the public gets. And then you can begin to make people open to talk at one another. But in the case of Central Appalachia, it was the heritage, the history of which both sides were able to come uh, and find that common ground. And maybe there are other sites like that in America today where the groups can rally around it. You look at the Grand Canyon right now, for example, that's threatened with, I believe, copper mining, if I'm not mistaken. There are areas that are threatened with that, and you have native groups that are fighting it, and you have others that are saying it's good for the local economy. But if you get, you can take places like the Grand Canyon, places of maybe, uh, in, uh, of like, environmental or, or natural beauty that we see as, as important landmarks and use those places as springboards, I think. Let's scroll on down. I'm trying to get to every one of them here. I know, Chuck, I want to be mindful of your time. I realize you're, uh, you're, you're joining us from the East Coast where it is now after 10 o'clock. Uh, maybe, maybe one or two more questions. If, okay. if you've got the time, is that, is that okay? Yeah, sure. I, I can try to get through a couple more of these. I I've see the kind of for you too. I'm sorry. Hmm? I've got what? one I want to ask too. Okay. Uh, we have one here. Do you think the company's influence on education and way of life is the main reason why West Virginia and similar states that are so heavily union based tend to vote against their own best interests? Okay. A, a lot of things. Uh, it's complicated. It's complicated. Uh, in uh, a place like West Virginia. Why would a guy like Trump resonate in a place like West Virginia, which he had, by the way, his highest percentage of victory in any state in West Virginia? How could that happen? Well, in part, I mentioned how the coal industry has been able to subvert both parties in West Virginia, Democrats and Republicans. And uh, Trump did offer some kind of an outsider kind of alternative. But when he, but he would, uh, of course, make some outlandish claims, you know, to save the industry. But he would also occasionally, in, in the midst of like you see him saying fifty lies right back to back, he would say one thing that would like resonate. An example, he would talk about how the political system is rigged. It's a rigged system, you know. Uh, the the elections are all phony. Well, in West Virginia historically, it has been a rigged system. Uh, yeah, I mentioned how mine guards would fill out people's ballots for them uh, during, during the Cullen Street. Did you have um, Arch Moore, the father of Shelley Moore Capito, one of our two senators from West Virginia, he was caught uh, getting a uh, $300,000 cash bribe behind a dumpster in Charleston from uh, coal company officials by the FBI. In the coal counties uh, of, of Lincoln and Logan and Mingo alone, nearly 200 officials were arrested and charged with various forms of corruption between 1980 and 2000. So, when uh, so there's so much corruption uh, that uh, I don't know that Trump would offer the, this kind of alternative, and. It, 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 the, you can say that people are voting against their interest uh, to, to a certain degree, yes, but you know he's promising to keep an industry afloat that a lot of people want to keep afloat. Uh, and that, that was still you know kind of the heart of why people were so enthusiastic about him in this region. Um, 
our progressive politics, they're doomed in, in West Virginia. There was a movement called West Virginia Can't Wait, a progressive movement that started by one of the board members who founded the Mine Wars Museum, Katie Lauer. And she was also one of the organizers of our 2011 protest march. And uh, they, they started up a progressive campaign called West Virginia Can't Wait, in which they're trying to elect people across the board from county boards of education to mayors, uh, to try to build a grassroots progressive movement in West Virginia. They were successful in getting a couple handful of people elected in this last election. Uh, they're continuing to work and organize. Um, it when you say progressive politics, it really depends because uh, people are largely socially conservative. However, they'd be much more willing for a progressive economic policy um, but it's still a very socially conservative place. Uh, one of the issues that I only touch upon in the book, uh, in my first draft, I went into much more detail, but um, it's uh, evangelical Christianity plays a really big role uh, around here. And uh, a lot of Christians see progressives as some kind of boogeyman that wants to like take all the Christians and put them in concentration camps. And I know that sounds uh, uh, kind of hyperbolic, but it, it's there are some people that have gone to an extreme to where they believe that kind of thing uh, in the age that we live in now. And it's difficult to, uh, uh, a lot of people don't, uh, not, a, not the majority of people, but there is a, a fair amount of people that feel as though if, if progressive politics take over, that it's going to be a threat on people's religion. And that, that, uh, and that is a big element of uh, why people may be hesitant towards some type of progressivism. If progressives on a national level are willing to make coalitions with progressives in rural areas that may be a little more socially conservative, but be willing to be uh, progressively economically, then I, th I think you would have a much more uh, broader coalition that you could build. Uh, uh, somebody just asked a question about a religious component, the operation of the mining company. Um, it, well, uh, it depends. I mean, you had a lot of pro-labor unions. I mentioned company churches, but outside of the company towns, you had pro-labor churches in, in West Virginia. In fact, one of the real interesting things, if you go back 100 years, the Socialist Party was fairly prominent in West Virginia during the mine wars. And in West Virginia, socialists were one of two groups, miners and evangelical Christians. Now, if I walk, uh, and which kind of sounds kind of out there, when you think of evangelical Christians today, you think of people that watch Fox News 24 7. That was not the case 100 years ago. Uh, and so there was a strong pro union church uh, element uh, in, uh, in the coal fields. And, and there still is uh, some of that today. You can, there, there are still pro union churches and anti-union churches, uh, you still have that kind of dynamic uh, that you have there. Uh, but real, uh, religion is a very complex uh, aspect of life uh, in central Appalachia. And, and I don't know if we'll have time to really deal with it and give it any kind of justice with that. Um, so I have one about how Coal companies have changed over the years. It's just that they don't use mine guards anymore because they can't get away with it. Everything else they do is the same. <laughs> if you want the short answer. Um, so um, how many people were sacrificed in that battle? I think you're talking about the Battle of Blair Mountain itself. We don't know the exact uh, the actual amount of deaths. Uh, my estimate is probably around 50 to 100, uh, but we'll know more if we ever get to do a full archaeological survey of the battlefield. That might, that might reveal some more things. Um, and with hiding, removing essential history from the National Register, who is benefiting? 
And what can you conclude uh, with this? Well, the coal industry is benefiting from erasing the history. I say this in the introduction or the preface to the book is the many aspects of life in contemporary Appalachia reflect the consequences of erased history. Uh, and that, uh, I don't think that's just the case for Appalachia. I think that's nationally. Whether you're talking about Tulsa, the, uh, you know, the Tulsa massacre, or whether you're talking about uh, things like the Battle of Blair Mountain, labor history and racial history have been glo glossed over and whitewashed in America, gender history as well. Uh, and um, those who benefit from erasing history are those who have established the power structure. Keeping people in ignorance about their own past is one way to perpetuate the status quo. And so that's who benefits from hiding uh, the history. Those who have profited uh, from the fossil fuel industry, obviously uh, profit from distorting the image of that industry. And so with that Mind Wars Museum that we've created, it's not just telling a history, but it is an act of protest in and of itself, its very existence, because its very existence, telling the story itself, is a challenge to the power structure that exists in Central Appalachia. So, Alex, you had a question? That, that last response completely touches on exactly what I wanted to ask you about. And that's that, that sort of ongoing battle for narrative authority. Um, mm -hmm. I think maybe by way of closing though, is there, is there any way you can kind of just maybe for, for a minute or two, tell us a little bit about the, the physical site and the history that is, um, you know, th that's available to people on this site that you and the Friends of Blair Mountain have preserved um, and, and what it says about kind of the, um, you know, okay. your vision. Uh, of yeah, so, so uh, a lot of what I, in 2012, I read out this big, um, not big, but, but I wrote out a, a report uh, on envisioning uh, what a historic park at Blair Mountain can look like, what it could do for the county, what could it do for that region. Uh, and, it envisioned, you know, uh, hiking trails and, you know, uh, places where people could go up on the battlefield, a museum, like an art gallery, place to, to have events, maybe a bit of a living history, coal town, all of those kinds of things. Some of the, many of those things are organically occurring now in the Mind Wars Museum in Mate One. And the, the first thing that, that, you, that I would want people to do is look at the Mind Wars Museum, wvmindwars.org. Uh, or find us on Facebook. Go there, look at the site. We, by the way, we we have a new uh, digital exhibit, uh, virtual exhibit uh, on uh, the archaeology of Blair Mountain and the things that have been found there. Uh, it's an archaeological gold mine. Uh, I was just up there on the battlefield a few weeks ago, and we were finding these. 30-06 shells uh, the, that were found at the battle. This is one uh, of many. Uh, we have hundreds uh, of these. But uh, from these, of course, we can reconstruct what happened at the battle because you can know what kind of weapons the miners were using, where they were. There's no primary documents that tell us about the fighting uh, of the battle. So we have to use archaeology to completely reconstruct it. And uh, we went up on, on, a, on one area on a White's Trace branch and, and you find, you can see miners were standing behind this lump of trees. They were firing shots in this direction. And you can see how close the fighting, where entrenchments were, where the foxholes were dug, all of those kinds of things. The, the site itself, it's huge, it's massive. I mean, the battlefield stretches for 12 miles. But, but by, by putting it back on the National Register, we, we brought about the largest environmental victory <laughs> that we've ever had in the history of the state against mountaintop removal by permanently saving 12 miles of bridge line from mountaintop removal coal mining. So we used history to bring about the biggest environmental victory that we've ever had there, uh, which is, uh, I think, significant. But um, uh, I, I think that uh, it's, it's a beautiful place. It's very, uh, a lot of the battlefield is inaccessible to the public. In some places, there aren't any roads that go near to where the fighting took place. So you'd have to hike for a full day 
uh, just to get to where the battlefield is really dense forested area, extremely steep, extremely difficult to traverse. Only about 25% of the actual battlefield has ever been studied uh, or explored. So there are huge swaths of it that, that, that we haven't even gotten a chance to look at. Um, but uh, it's protected at least from, from mining and uh, the Mine Wars Museum, we, we've gotten a lot of momentum that we've built up because of the centennial celebration that, that took place a month ago over Labor Day weekend. And uh, we're using that momentum and building more coalitions to eventually we plan to have some sites there. We, we have some land, uh, some organizations that might be interested in buying up some of the land on the battlefield that will enable us to get full archeological surveys and uh, give the public some access to it. So we're still working and we're still making progress and we're continuing to tell the story. Excellent. I, I opened the seminar this, this quarter by talking about kind of the, the recuperative role of labor history and kind of the way that uh, when done well, it sort of shares all of our histories. And I think that I can't imagine a better place we could have started this quarter off than 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 with your work and your I mean your family's work and the way that it you know both looks back and extends uh, forward into the future. So I, I just want to thank you again for uh, for staying up late for us and for uh, kicking this seminar series off. This was absolutely fantastic. Uh, please join me in giving Chuck a round of digital applause. Excellent. And, and just thanks again. This was a real treat. I, I mentioned to the students last week, I'm originally from West Virginia. So this, this history is uh, near and dear to my heart. And I just feel like this book, if you're, if you're, this is, it's a page turner. It's a, it's a bureaucratic uh, suspense novel at times. I mean, it's just really well done and congratulations on that. Well, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. And thanks to everybody for sticking around and uh, listening to me talk about it. So I appreciate it very much. Excellent. And thanks for everybody tuning in tonight and uh, join us next Wednesday when we'll be celebrating uh, Filipino American Heritage Month with Cindy Domingo, Michael McCann, and some, uh, some organizers. <laughs>